Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I think I've muted everyone, but if you don't mind, you can just mute yourself. If you're not muted, that would be great. Thank you for joining. So our talk today is going to be from Bita Manzuri at Queen's Hospital. Ms. Manzuri is a corneal and cataract surgeon and has led the eye casualty department at Queen's Hospital in Romford since 2014. She graduated from UCL with first class honors, as well as distinction in her medical degree. She underwent her ophthalmic training at the Western Eye and Moorfield Hospital and undertook research leading to a PhD degree at the Institute of Ophthalmology. She is an honorary clinical senior lecturer at Barts and the Medical School, and she's a reviewer for ophthalmic journals and presents at national and international meetings. And we just want to welcome you on behalf of SCOPE. It's really important to us during this time to be able to connect with our customers and to be able to provide hopefully really helpful education, especially to try to bridge the gap between um, what happens in primary care and um, secondary care at the moment. So I'll begin. If you have any questions, please do type them out in the um, chat box and we'll get back to you within a few days. Thank you. It's important to state that I have no financial interests in any of the products mentioned in this talk. So the aims of this talk will be to understand the etiology of some of the common causes of red eyes and the appropriate first line management for some of these conditions. I will then go on to talk about the common red flag signs and symptoms the Warren referral to the ophthalmologist. And finally, given that we are in the midst of the allergy season, I will just spend the latter part of the talk expanding on the subject of ocular allergy and aids to diagnosis and appropriate treatments. Red eyes are a common cause of presentation to primary care, whether that be at the GP surgery or the opticians and they indicate some form of ocular inflammation that, caught, that has caused dilatation or engorgement of ocular blood vessels. There are many causes of red eyes, and in general, these can be divided into cold cases, some of which can be self-limiting, for example, bacterial conjunctivitis, or hot cases that need specialist input from an ophthalmologist. So a couple of slides for revision of the anatomy of the eye. As ophthalmologists, we are notorious for using ophthalmist speak and acronyms in our work on the assumption that everyone will know what we're talking about. So a little bit of basic anatomy. You have the black pupil at the center, surrounded by the iris sphincter muscle, which contracts and expands to allow different amounts of light into the eye. The pupil and the iris are separated from the front of the eye, the cornea, by the anterior chamber. And the border between the cornea, which I'll show on the next slide, and the sclera is known as, this, as the limbus. The sclera is the white of the eye, overlying which is the clear, transparent conjunctival mucous membrane. The inner corner of the eye is known as the medial canthus, the outer corner of the eye, the lateral canthus and the space between the upper lid and the lower lid when the eye is open is known as the palpable aperture. Along the lid margins, you have the location of a number of glands, the meibomian glands, which produce the sebaceous secretions of the eye, and the glands of mole, the sweat glands, and zeiss, other sebaceous glands, both located at the base of the lashes. As already mentioned, overlying the pupil and iris and separated from them by the anterior chamber of the eye is the cornea, more readily visible when the eye is looked on from the side as in this picture. It is, to put it plainly, the window of the eye and responsible for two thirds of the refractive power of the eye. 
So any condition that affects the clarity of the cornea will have a detrimental effect on the patient's vision. In the next two slides, I have just listed the common conditions that affect each of the structures of the anterior segment of the eye that can manifest with the symptom of red eyes. So you can see that list is quite extensive. For the purposes of this talk, I will just discuss some of the more common conditions that present in the primary care setting with red eyes. Being aware that in the primary care setting, the examination of the eyes can be very limited in both method and time. And so I really want to emphasize the importance of taking an adequate history to help you arrive at the correct diagnosis. In eyes, there are about eight symptoms that can present in various combinations. These are redness, pain, watering, some form of discharge, a change in the quality of vision, sensitivity to light, itching and grittiness. Grittiness can also manifest as a burning sensation or a foreign body sensation. Of these eight symptoms, there are four that are the most important, highlighted in red, and a useful acronym to help you remember them is RSVP, redness, sensitivity to light, a change in vision and pain. For each of these symptoms, ascertain the acuteness of onset The examination of the patient's eyes begins from the moment the patient walks into the room. A patient who has rheumatoid hands will be a higher risk of developing dry eyes secondary to their rheumatoid arthritis. A patient with a typical question mark posture of ankylosing spondylitis will have a higher risk of developing acute anterior uveitis. So the importance of looking at the patient as a whole Record the visual acuity. I cannot emphasize this enough. Examine the eyelids looking for edema and vesicles. And if you have the confidence to go ahead and invert the lid, look at the conjunctiva looking for sector or a diffuse pattern of injection. Assess the cornea for clarity and if possible, for the presence of corneal sensation. Look at the pupils and see if they react appropriately to light? Do they have a regular shape? Assess eye movements and make sure that the two eyes are moving together and moving equally. Endoscopy is perhaps less relevant when assessing red eyes, which are a manifestation of an anterior segment problem more often than not. But it is important to look for preauricular lymphadenopathy, especially if you are suspecting conjunctivitis of a viral or an origin. And finally, although you may not have access to some of the uh, instrumentation we use for uh, measuring intraocular pressure, it is possible to get a digital assessment of the intraocular pressure by simply palpating the globe using your index finger over the closed eyelid and comparing one side to another. I'd like to introduce you to the Edinburgh Red Eye Diagnostic Algorithm, which, as the name implies, was developed in Edinburgh and whose use has been shown to prevent delayed presentations of certain serious red eye conditions and thereby has helped to reduce the morbidity from delayed treatment. It consists of a series of questions. And this questionnaire has been designed and made available to clinicians referring patients to the acute ophthalmology service within Edinburgh. The questionnaire involved the non-ophthalmologists using an algorithm to reach a diagnosis in patients presenting with red eyes. And what they found when they published the results was that the diagnostic accuracy of non-ophthalmologists when assessing patients presenting with red eyes was greater when the algorithm was used.
So I'd like to go on now and talk about some of the common red eye conditions that may present in the primary care setting and how to best manage these patients. Blepharitis is one of the most common causes of red eyes presenting in a primary care setting. It is characterized by inflammation of the eyelids and this can be associated with a staphylococcal infection of the lid margins. It is typically classified as being anterior or posterior. Anterior blepharitis is inflammation at the base of the eyelashes, manifesting as crusts on the lashes. And it tends to be less common than posterior blepharitis, which is inflammation of the inner portion of the eyelid at the level of the meibomian glands. The normal secretions of the meibomian glands, as you can see in this top right picture, have become thick and yellow instead of being free flowing and clear. Another name for posterior blepharitis is marginal gland disease, often shortened to MGD, an acronym that you may come across in ophthalmology letters. This is a schematic diagram to show the difference between a normal eye and an eye with blepharitis, as observed with a naked eye. You can see that there are crusts on the eyelashes and just behind the base of the eyelashes, the lid is red and swollen. These stagnated secretions of the meibomian glands, along with these crusts on the base of the eyelashes, cause ocular inflammation and ocular irritation, hence the presentation with red eyes. Treatment involves an eyelid cleansing regime with hot compresses and massage, often with the use of eyelid scrubs and lubricants to help relieve the symptoms of ocular surface irritation. Occasionally, it may be necessary to use antibiotic ointment on the eyelids to reduce the bacterial load. One slide to talk about cordiola, which represent acute bacterial infection and subsequent abscess formation of the eyelid's sebaceous glands. Two forms are recognized clinically, external cordiola, which involve the more superficial Zeiss glands situated at the base of the lashes, and internal cordiola, which affect the deeper meibomian glands within the tarsal plate. Hordiola in themselves don't cause a red eye, but should there be a rupture of a hordiola, an extrusion of its infective contents, then you can get conjunctivitis and a consequent red eye. So this brings us very nicely onto the subject of bacterial conjunctivitis, which can present unilaterally or affect both eyes with a mucopurulent or purulent discharge that is present throughout the day, with the patient also complaining of a burning sensation to the ocular surface. It is highly contagious, with spread by direct contact with the individual or contact with contaminated objects, such as a face towel that may be shared between several members of the family. It is a self-limiting condition, but treatment is recommended to shorten the duration and limit spread. The most common treatment in the UK is the use of chloramphenicol drops or ointment, drops having the advantage of not causing visual blurring on installation. Viral conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye, can also present unilaterally or bilaterally with an acutely red eye associated with a watery or mucoserous discharge. There can also be chemosis, which is swelling of the conjunctiva associated with a burning, gritty, sandy ocular surface irritation. Rarely, the patient may also have photophobia, and often they have a tender preauricular node, which I'll show on the next slide. It is very common in children and can spread like wildfire through nursery. It can also affect the cornea, and if at any time the vision is affected and the patient is complaining of a reduction in vision or a blurriness of vision, then consider referral to an ophthalmologist for commencement of topical steroid therapy. This is a slide to show you the location of the preauricular nodes. 
you simply palpate the area in front of each of the ears and look for an enlarged, palpable, tender node. The presence of preauricular lymphadenopathy in the presence of bilateral red eyes clenches the diagnosis of viral conjunctivitis. For the sake of completeness, I'd also like to just briefly mention neonatal conjunctivitis. This is an urgent site-threatening infection that warrants same-day referral to the local ophthalmology unit. As the name implies, it presents during the first month of life, with the most common causes being chlamydia, gonorrhea, and herpes simplex virus. These infections are acquired during the passage through the birth canal at the time of a vaginal delivery. The baby presents with erythema and edema of the eyelids and the palpable conjunctiva associated with the profuse purulent eye discharge that is visible at the naked eye examination. It's important to be aware of such a diagnosis and its implications for the parents since chlamydia, gonorrhea, and herpes simplex virus infection of the genitalia are all sexually transmitted diseases. Another cause of red eyes that perhaps present less frequently to the general practitioner is a corneal abrasion. This is a very painful condition and often the patients won't let you near them until you've instilled a drop of local anesthetic into the eyes. It's painful because the cornea is the most highly innervated structure of the human body. In these patients, after the installation of anesthetic, it's important to avert the eyelid to make sure that you're not missing any foreign body lodged, un lodged underneath the eyelid that is causing the corneal abrasion. If the corneal abrasion is associated with an infiltrate, a cloudiness of the cornea, then these patients must be urgently referred to the local ophthalmology unit. The point I want to make here about corneal abrasions is that the treatment which involves the use of antibiotic ointment, a cyclopedic to relieve the pain caused by the ciliary spasm, and possibly patching, patients can be patched if they are not children. You must not patch children because even patching for a short period of time to help relieve the pain can affect the visual development of that eye. So some examples of a corneal abrasion. Here you have fluorescein instilled in the eye and a white light shone on the eye. And here you have a large abrasion that shows up with fluorescein looked at with a blue light. A corneal or subtarsal foreign body can result from both a high velocity or a low velocity injury to the eye. For example, a patient who's hammering away on a piece of metal and a piece flies into their eye. If there is a high velocity injury, then do consider to the local ophthalmology unit in case there is further penetration of the corneal foreign body into the substance of the eye. For any corneal foreign body, do not attempt removal of the foreign body using a cotton bud, simply because more often than not, the cotton bud wedges the foreign body deeper into the corneal stroma. In an eye casualty setting, we often take these foreign bodies out using the tip of a green needle, which lifts the edge of the foreign body away from the corneal stroma. Here is an example of a corneal foreign body, an example of a subtarsal foreign body. And this is fluorescence fluorescent staining of the ocular surface resultant from a subtarsal foreign body. Often, a patient who presents with a subtarsal foreign body may complain that they were out walking in windy weather 
they felt something go into their eye, but when they've looked in the mirror, they can't actually see anything on their ocular surface. One clue, if you can't see the uh, subtarsal foreign body straight away, is to put a little bit of fluorescein and look with a blue light. And if you have these linear scratches, this tells you that there must be a subtarsal foreign body, since the scratches are resultant from the foreign body wedged underneath the lid, scraping the front surface of the cornea each time the patient blinks. And here are some more examples of corneal foreign bodies and one subtarsal foreign body in the right lower corner. Subconjunctival hemorrhages often present in patients who themselves were asymptomatic, but the bleed in their eye was noticed by someone else, or the patient noticed themselves when they looked in the mirror. I often ask my patients, if you were on a desert island with no access to a mirror, would you think there was anything wrong with, a, with your eye? And more often than not, the patient would say that their eyes were completely asymptomatic. If anything, they may complain of mild ocular irritation, but nothing that would be of concern to them. Subconjunctival hemorrhages result from an increase in head pressure, the Valsalva manoeuvre, such as that which occurs with a bout of coughing or straining at the time of passing stool. Important in these patients to inquire about trauma, and I'll show you why that's relevant in terms of the posterior defining line of the subconjunctival hemorrhage. Measure the blood pressure in these patients, since an elevated blood pressure is associated with recurrent subconjunctival hemorrhages. And if the blood pressure is normal on the one occasion, but the patient has recurrent subconjunctival hemorrhages, then do consider 24 hour monitoring of their blood pressure. The subconjunctival hemorrhage themselves is quite self-limiting, resolving within two to three weeks. But if possible, do ask if the patient can discontinue the use of aspirin or non-steroidals during the period of recovery. Here are some subconjunctival hemorrhages. The upper two pictures show very classical subconjunctival hemorrhages. The lower two pictures are in young patients who sustain trauma. Now that's quite relevant because if a young patient presents to you with a subconjunctival hemorrhage, the posterior border of which is not visible, then that should raise concerns about whether the patient has a fracture of their orbital walls or a basal skull fracture. Another cause of red eyes and a very common cause of red eyes is dry eyes. Patients often present with a sensation of a burning ocular surface associated with a bit of itching. The eyes may be aching, sore and fatigued and often they feel that they get some relief by simply closing their eyes. The patient themselves may describe their eyes as being dry. Uh, the eyes will be red, they may be sensitive to the light, and they may have intermittent blurred vision, which is relieved when they blink several times. Dry eyes result from a number of causes, including the normal aging process and menopause. And uh, perhaps one of the uh, causes that I have not included on this slide is after laser refractive surgery particularly a procedure called LASIK. LASIK involves making a flap in the cornea and reshaping the corneal surface in order to help improve a patient's eyesight. But the process of creating a flap cuts the ocular nerves, thereby you lose the neurological stimulus to tear production and consequently the patient suffers from dry eyes. schematic diagram to show some of the signs and symptoms that are associated with the presence of dry eyes. There are several non-medical ways of helping improve dry eye symptoms, including those listed here.
There is a step ladder for treatment of dry eyes and perhaps only relevant to the remit of this talk is the first rung on that ladder, which is the use of artificial tears, gels and ointments, as well as performing daily lip massage and supplementing your diet with omega-3 fatty oils. There is a plethora of different types of artificial drops, gels and ointments available. And there's a multitude of manufacturers that produce these. And uh, since this is a talk that is kindly sponsored by Scope, I've put out the range that is available from one manufacturer. Most of these dry eye uh, lubricants differ slightly in the ingredients they use, but the main difference between them is the degree of viscosity. You have low viscosity agents that need to be used more often, but they have the advantage of not causing any blurring on installation. And you have high viscosity agents, which have the advantage of only being used two or three times a day, but they do cause some ocular blurring on installation. So you really, what you give to the patient is not only determined by the cost implications, but also by the needs of the patient and their job and their ability to use drops regularly throughout the course of the day. One point of note is that all the medications on this slide are preservative free, and this has the advantage of producing less ocular inflammation. Very briefly, I'd just like to uh, mention a pterygium because this can be a pseudo cause of red eyes. A pterygium is also known as a surface eye and is a benign growth of the conjunctiva that often starts on the nasal side within the palpable aperture. There is an association with working outdoors and increased UV exposure as well as exposure to the elements. And the underlying thought process is that the UV light is uh, bounced off the side of the nose onto the nasal conjunctiva where it causes damage and precipitates the formation of a pterygium. A pterygium can give the appearance of a red eye. But if you open the palpable aperture widely, you will see that it's only this triangular area of tissue that is red and the rest of the conjunctiva is lovely and white. There are some examples of pterygia. So you can see this wing-like structure that starts at the nasal conjunctiva and comes across the cornea. Patients may complain of some ocular irritation, in which case they will just need require lubricants but these patients do need to be referred to the local ophthalmology unit if the pterygium has grown over the visual axis and is therefore causing a reduction in, in, in the patient's vision. So the next two slides are some summary slides just to summarize the treatments that have been mentioned so far for the various causes of red eyes that we've discussed. Um, the exclamation marks refer to the, uh, those points that I just want to highlight. So in the case of viral conjunctivitis, you require referral to an ophthalmologist if the vision is reduced. The importance of the same day referral of a, a baby with neonatal conjunctivitis and the importance of not patching an eye with a corneal abrasion if the patient is a child. And again, um, you're very welcome to take screenshots if these uh, slides will help serve as aid memoirs. So I'd now like to move on to some of the sight threatening causes of red eyes um, listed here and the importance of referring these patients as soon as possible to a local ophthalmology unit. Start with preceptor cellulitis. And although preceptor cellulitis is not a site threatening condition and can be very easily managed in the community, it is sometimes very difficult to differentiate it from mm. orbital cellulitis, which is a site threatening condition. Now, preceptor cellulitis presents with tenderness, swelling, redness of the eyelids, and the periorbital area, often in one eye. And the patient may have a mild fever as well as a history of sinusitis or a cut on the skin, or an insect bite around the eye, or a, a lump on the eye, a chalasia that has now become infected. 
we have the typical signs of infection present, uh, including heat, redness, swelling of the lids, and pain. But important is the significant absences. You don't have any proptosis, any protrusion of the eyeball. There is no effect on the vision. There's no restriction or pain on extraocular movements. And usually the eye itself, the globe, is white. It's often just the skin around the eye that's very red, tender, and swollen. Now, compare that with orbital cellulitis, which does present with a red eye associated with pain and blurred vision. There is eyelid swelling and conjunctival hyperemia and proptosis, a protrusion of the eyeball. But in addition, you also have conjunctival chemosis, swelling of the conjunctiva, and a restriction of extraocular motility, as well as pain on eye movement. There may also be signs of compromise of the optic nerve, including optic disc edema, uh, re relative afferent pupillary defect, and reduced vision. Here are some examples of orbital cellulitis presenting an adult, a much more severe form of orbital cellulitis with obvious proptosis, and orbital cellulitis that can also present in children, again, of various severity. Now, in this child, you would look at them and think, well, the eye is white, so this can't possibly be orbital cellulitis. But you have to take my word for it when I say that if you compare the movement of these two eyes, there is a restriction on lateral gaze of the left eye as compared to the right eye. And this child did indeed have orbital cellulitis. So again, the importance of same day referral to the local ophthalmology unit for this sight threatening condition. Acute angle closure glaucoma is another cause, albeit rare, of a red eye that presents in a primary care setting. The patient often complains of a severe constant pain in the eye, accompanied possibly by sickness and vomiting, halos around lights, especially in low light conditions, and an intense headache. On examination, you have ciliary injection, which is injection in a ring around the limbus, associated with an uneven or even unreactive pupil, a cornea that has lost its clarity as a result of edema, and a tense eye consequent to the raised intraocular pressure. This is an emergency, so immediate referral, referral is warranted. And just a point of note, when these patients do present to the local ophthalmology unit, they also get prophylactic treatment to their other unaffected eye to prevent the same problems from occurring in that eye. This is a picture of what an eye with acute glaucoma looks like. So you have injection, around the limbus. You have a cornea that's lost its clarity. Um, it doesn't have the same sheen to it. And you have a pupil that is uh, mid-dilated and unresponsive to light. Corneal infections are another common cause of red eyes. These can have various etiologies, including immune, such as that which occurs in marginal keratitis, or infective, as seen in microbial keratitis or herpetic keratitis. Where an infection of the cornea extends to involve structures within the globe itself, then you can have the development of an endophthalmitis, which is a very serious condition. Any patient who presents with an infiltrate, a opacity on the cornea associated with a red eye, then you need to ask them about contact lens wear and the, the way they wear their contact lenses, the type of contact lens wear. Ask them about any history of trauma and also inquire whether they've had similar episodes in the past, since that may give you a clue to the underlying cause of the corneal infiltrate. This is an example of keratitis. Uh, in this particular case, this is marginal keratitis, which as the name implies, there is an infiltrate in the margins of the cornea. On the left, you have a simple marginal keratitis. On the right, a more extensive case where you have a ring of infiltrates all of the margins of the cornea. 
This has an immune basis and requires both steroids and antibiotic drops to help resolve the condition. Here is an example of herpes simplex keratitis, characterized by the simple dendritic staining pattern that is readily visible after installation of fluorescein into the conjunctival sac and shining a blue light on the eye. This can easily be treated by the use of gancyclovir ointment topically five times a day for two weeks. But it is a condition that can come back time and time again, hence the importance of asking at the time of taking the history whether a patient has had similar episodes in the past. And finally, this is an episode of microbial keratitis, secondary to contact lens wear. It is well known that patients abuse the wear of contact lenses. They wear them for extended periods of time. They shower in them, they sleep in them, they uh, swim in them. And uh, this is a sight-threatening emergency, not only because it can result in corneal scarring, uh, therefore impeding the vision, but it can extend into the globe itself, causing a severe endophthalmitis. A patient who presents with a red eye and an ill-defined Ill infiltrate, as shown in this example, and who is a contact lens wearer, needs urgent same-day referral to the local ophthalmology unit. I'd just like to very briefly mention three itis uh, conditions of the eyes, episcleritis, scleritis, and anterior simply because they can present with red eyes in a primary care setting. Episcleritis is inflammation of the episclera. The episclera is a layer of tissue lying between the conjunctiva and the sclera. And it can be idiopathic or associated with a number of vascular or connective tissue disorders. It tends to have a rapid onset with grittiness and a dull headache, but no visual disturbance. And typically a very focal area of the conjunctiva is affected. And when you look at the vessels in this affected area, they have a radial configuration to them. Episcleritis without treatment is self-limiting, but often the patient requires treatment in the form of lubricants for symptom relief from the grittiness, or uh, very mild topical steroids to reduce the duration of the symptoms. However, it is a recurrent condition that can affect the same eye or it can affect the other eye. Scleritis can have both an infectious and an autoimmune etiology and is often associated with some degree of visual disturbance. You tend to get uh, edema and discoloration of the scleral plexus um, and often the area of discoloration is much deeper to the conjunctiva and has more of a violet hue to it as opposed to a bright red hue. Scleritis can be classified as being nodular, diffuse or necrotizing and can affect the anterior segment of the eye or the posterior segment. And examples of scleritis. Here you have a focal area of scleritis, but you can see that the area of redness is much deeper than the conjunctiva. The conjunctival vessels themselves aren't actually that inflamed or dilated or engorged. Here is a more severe form of uh, scleritis. And you can see that just to the left of the, of the limbus, there is an area of the choroid that is beginning to show through, and that is an area of necrosis of the sclera. And here you have an example of nodulous scleritis, where you have a nodule in, this, in the middle of this area of injection. Finally, uveitis. Uveitis is an inflammation of the uveal tract, which consists of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. Uveitis can be classified as being anterior, intermediate, or posterior, and often it's only the anterior that tends to cause red eyes, unless you have an anterior associated with an intermediate or a posterior uveitis. Patients typically present with pain on eye movement, redness, sensitivity to light, watering, and a reduction in vision. And you have the classical signs of a ciliary flush or redness around the edge of the limbus 
an irregular sluggish pupil which may have an irregular shape to it as a result of being stuck down to the anterior lens surface. You may have a raised intraocular pressure and the cornea may become hazy as a result of keratitic precipitates. These are aggregations of protein and white blood cells that have leaked into the anterior chamber as a result of the inflammation causing increased vascular permeability. Uveitis requires steroids for appropriate treatment and therefore I would suggest that these patients get a referral to the local ophthalmology unit to be seen within 48 hours. Under very exceptional circumstances where a patient has had several episodes of recurrent uveitis and they are able to recognize the early signs of their uveitis would the ophthalmologist allow the patient to start steroids uh, of their own accord with a prescription that has been provided to them beforehand. Some pictures to show you the appearance of a uveitic eye. Here you have a redness of the conjunctiva, but surrounding the limbus and a very irregular, a poorly reactive pupil. This is an a uh, schematic diagram to show you what the ciliary flush, that area of ciliary injection looks like. And here is an example of keratitic precipitates, this aggregation of white cells and protein that are stuck to the inner corneal surface and that affect the vision of the eye. So I think you can appreciate that to all of these um, conditions that are sight threatening have a core group of symptoms that are in common and these really constitute the red flag symptoms and again referring to one of my earlier slides it is that RSVP marked redness of one eye moderate to severe eye pain especially if unilateral any form of visual abnormality whether that be a reduction in vision or a total loss of vision the presence of double vision blurred vision halos around lights, or a distortion of straight lines, and either sensitivity or complete avoidance of bright lights, photophobia. Any patient who has a history of recent trauma, chemical injury, or recent eye surgery, and has now presented with a painful red eye, should also be referred to the local ophthalmology unit. And finally, a patient who presents with a history of sudden floaters, perhaps associated with flashing lights, or a curtain that comes across the vision through which they can't see also needs referral to the ophthalmology unit to exclude the presence of a retinal detachment. Then there are the red flag signs, such as decreased visual acuity, which I've already alluded to, any pupil irregularity, including a sluggish pupillary reaction to light, any opacity on the cornea, the presence of hyphema, that is, blood in the anterior chamber, as shown in the upper picture, or a hypopium, that is, pus in the anterior chamber, as shown in the lower picture, and ocular firmness, indicating a raised intraocular pressure, as assessed by digital palpation. So this brings me on to the last part of my talk, where I'd just like to concentrate a little bit more on ocular allergy. Why is ocular allergy so prevalent? Because the surface of the eye is the most obviously exposed mucous membrane of the body. And we are currently in the midst of the allergy season, so I really want to talk to you about the appropriate way of diagnosing these patients and treating them. The triad of symptoms that are typical of allergy include itching, a stringy or ropey discharge, and redness. Of these three, the most important is itching. If a patient does not have itching as their main prevalent symptom, then I would be very hesitant about diagnosing them with any form of ocular allergy. So, um, in a shortened way, you can say that if it itches, it's allergy. If it burns, it's probably a dry eye. And if the eyelids are stuck together in the morning, then it's most likely a bacterial infection. There are different types of ocular allergy of different degrees of severity. The ones that commonly present in a primary care setting and the ones that I will be concentrating on for the purpose of this talk are seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and perennial allergic conjunctivitis. 
neither of which is site-threatening. The more severe forms of vernal and atopic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis are site-threatening and do require early input from an ophthalmologist for their management. So a little bit of background on ocular allergy. In a European study, allergic conjunctivitis alone was estimated to affect just under a third of the general population and seasonal allergic conjunctivitis accounts for over half of the most common forms of ocular allergy. So seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and perennial allergic conjunctivitis are commonly grouped together. And as I've already said, the conjunctiva is a mucosal surface similar to the nasal mucosa. So the same allergens that trigger allergic rhinitis may be involved in the pathogenesis of allergic conjunctivitis. And again, as you know, this is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to specific airborne pollen allergens and involves mast cells, histamine, and IgE. Uh, both of these conditions are frequently associated with hay fever and asthma, and they're very prevalent in the pediatric and young adult populations. And really, the difference between the two is the, um, a difference in the onset of the timing of their symptom. Seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, as the name applies, typically occurs in a defined season. Um, patients who have an allergy to tree pollen get their symptoms in the spring, those who have an allergy to grass pollen at the height of summer, and those who have an allergy to weed pollen get their symptoms in autumn. Um, typically, patients are symptom-free during the winter months, especially in the cooler climates, because of the decreased transmission of these airborne allergens. This is a pollen calendar and it shows you the months in which the allergy season begins, which is often towards the end of February, beginning of March, and when the allergy season ends, which is again towards the end of September, beginning of October. The graph on the right shows the various types of uh, pollen that patients are typically allergic to and when this pollen is prevalent in the air. Perennial allergic conjunctivitis presents with symptoms that are very similar to seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, but in these patients, their symptoms last all year round, and that's because uh, their underlying allergen is an allergen that is present all year round, such as house dust mite, animal dander, or tobacco dust. Um, however, perennial allergic patients may also have seasonal exacerbations if they're also allergic to a seasonal allergen. Both of these patients present with red eyes that can be associated with watering and a mucus discharge. They tend to have a conjunctival chemosis, so swelling of the conjunctiva, and they may also have redness and irritation of the skin that surrounds their eye. If you invert the lid, you may be able to see very small papillae, and if you stain the conjunctival with fluorescein, you may see punctate staining of the, uh, of the con cornea. I have just uh, put up a little table that shows the different forms of allergen that affect patients who have seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and those who suffer from perennial allergic conjunctivitis. The diagnosis of allergic conjunctivitis is often clinical and it's based on a very good history and examination. Itching is the hallmark of allergy. Without itching, as I've already stated, it's very difficult to make a diagnosis of, of allergy. Other symptoms include photophobia, a foreign body sensation, tearing, a spasm of the lids because of ocular surface irritation, redness and a watery mucus discharge. Do ask the patient about wearing contact lenses and how uh, tolerable the contact lenses are at the height of their allergy season. And ask about a history of atopic disease, both in themselves and, their, and in their family, including a disease, uh, diseases such as allergic rhinitis, asthma and atopic dermatitis.
I also ask patients whether they have any known food or drug allergies. There are different ways of treating these patients. You have a primary algorithm, the secondary algorithm, both of which can be commenced in the primary care setting. You have a tertiary algorithm, which is really the remit of the ophthalmologist. So what is the treatment of seasonal allergic and perennial allergic conjunctivitis? Well, you start with generic measures, which include allergen avoidance and control of the environment, the use of cool compresses, so a towel soaked in cold water, placed in the fridge for five minutes, then placed over the closed eyes, provides a great deal of symptom relief from the itching as well as reducing the swelling of the eyes. And in the same way, it also helps the patient if they keep their drops cooled, either in the fridge or in a cool bag if they're out and about. And again, it's very important wherever you can to use preservative free drops uh, in whatever topical medications you give to these patients. Use of artificial tears is very beneficial because it dilutes the allergen on the ocular surface as well as providing a relief from the discomfort experienced by these patients. The mainstay of treatment is the combined use of antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. Often I see patients who have seen their GP and have been given sodium chromogligate to use four times a day. Sodium chromogligate is a disease modifying drug. It causes mass, it stops mast cell degranulation but it can take up to six weeks for it to have its effect. So these patients are given sodium chromogligate, they take it, if you're lucky, four times a day, and then they come back to you after two weeks saying, well, the drops are no use, um, you know, they've not made my eyes any better. That's, that's, that's to be expected given the way the sodium chromogligate works. So really, you need to start by giving these patients an antihistamine, in order to produce immediate symptom relief. And then you can give them a second drop, whether it's a sodium chromogligate or an equivalent, to modify the disease to stop the effects of the disease down the line. Now, you can do this by giving the patients two separate drops, but I think you will find that there are, it is much more beneficial to the patient and more, much more cost-effective to a practice to use combination agents. These combination agents are a mixture of both an antihistamine and a mast cell stabilizer. And there are two currently on the market, Ketofol and Olive. Patadine. And again, these have several advantages. Uh, fewer drops going onto the eye, fewer bottles of drops, and um, the dosage is only twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Now, this is really useful if you have a child that's affected with allergy, because instead of needing to put the drops in four times a day, which may necess necessitate either the parent going into the school or the school nurse putting the drops in, you can just put the drops in once in the morning and once in the evening when the patient comes back from school. Ketofol has an advantage over olopatidine in being the first non-preserved dual agent that is, that is available on the market. You can also use non-steroidals um, and vasoconstrictors to relieve some of the ocular surface pain, um, inflammation and redness, but these are not really widely used. I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about ways of uh, avoiding allergen and, and manipulating your environment to improve your symptoms. A lot of the advice on this slide is just basic common sense. I'm not going to spend time reading through them, but it is worth noting uh, some of the steps that a patient can take to help improve the ocular allergic symptoms. These include, for example, um, keeping the windows and doors shut as much as possible, vacuuming regularly and dusting with a damp cloth, and buying a pollen filter for air vents and a HEPA 
uh, filter for your vacuum cleaner. And again, common sense things, don't hang your clothes outside to dry because they can catch pollen, especially if you have a pollen allergy. Uh, don't keep uh, fresh flowers inside the house and don't cut grass or walk on the grass if you know to have a grass allergy. So uh, just a list of common sense do's and don'ts um, to help improve your allergic symptoms um, over and above needing uh, topical medications. I would just like to briefly mention uh, Ketofol, uh, which has ketotophen as its active agent. This is a dual active agent and it's quite exciting on the UK market because it, it is the first uh, dual active agent that is preservative free. As I've mentioned before, in ocular allergy patients, you must try wherever possible to give patients preservative free topical formulations to reduce the ocular irritation that is consequent to preservatives. Um, Ketofol has um, ketotophen as its active agent, which is both an antihistamine and a mast cell stabilizer. And uh, it is also compatible with wearing contact lenses. Um, you can wear it with a contact lens inside the eye, or because it is only twice daily dosing, you can put it in before you put the contact lens in the morning and then put the second drop in after you've taken the contact lens out at night. So it acts uh, to uh, negate the effects of histamine, thereby producing immediate symptom relief, but it also stabilizes mast cells and inhibits their degranulation, therefore modifying the disease down the line and reducing the patient's symptoms uh, throughout the course of the allergy season. So I'd like to conclude um, this talk by just summarizing some of the salient points that have been mentioned. Um, I know red eyes can provide some diagnostic challenges, um, not only in the primary care setting, but also in the secondary care setting. And the aim of this talk was really to differentiate the emergency cases from those cold cases. The key to arriving at the correct diagnosis is by taking a thorough history. And this is especially relevant where the examination is very limited. I have discussed some of the red flag symptoms and signs to watch out for and introduced the acronym RSVP. And I have also introduced you to the Edinburgh Red Eye Algorithm, which I hope will help your diagnosis of red eyes and help you arrive at the correct diagnosis. Uh, we then went on to talk about allergic eye disease, and I hope I have shown that allergy is actually very easily treatable in the primary care setting. Um, but the treatment involves both medical and non-medical interventions. The mainstay of medical treatment is the dual actin agents, such as Ketofol, which was the first preservative-free dual actin agent available on the, in the UK market. Um, Along with these uh, dual actin agents, the regular use of lubricants, um, as well as non-medical interventions, will help improve the patient's symptoms throughout the course of the allergy season. Uh, important to avoid preservatives wherever possible, whether it's in the dual actin agent or whether it's in the lubricants. And uh, I would like to state that steroids do have a role to play in ocular allergy but it is important that these patients are under the care of an ophthalmologist who can monitor not only their response to steroids, but look out for some of the side effects that the steroids can cause. Hi all, that's the conclusion of her chat. I just wanted to make a note that we have actually changed the name of Vitapos. It is now called Hylonite. So um, information did go out to various CCGs and pharmacies, but we just wanted to make that extra clear for everyone that is um, that is present that that we have changed the name. And.